Why don't we begin right now? Let me welcome everybody. Greetings and welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation about a fascinating and very powerful technology and practice. Let me explain a bit about this week's guests. And I wanna make sure you can see this image. Normally I introduce people with a kind of um, uh, with a slide with some text on it, but this time we have a little poster made up by the awesome Lear Lobo, who um, I wanted to give a shout out to her for this really nice project. Today we're gonna to be talking about the technology of web annotation. And this is a technology that lets you annotate a web page, either individually or in groups. It's a powerful technology with a lot of pedagogical potential. Uh, there have been different projects doing it. The leading one right now is called Hypothesis. And we have three different brilliant people to help you explain and explore and, and see where this is going. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jeremy Dean, uh, who works uh, on Hypothesis. Remy Kalir, who has written software called Krell Layers, uh, which lets you build on top of this. And Amanda LaCostro, who has been doing some great scholarship into annotation, how it works and what we can do with it. So let me take this slide down and one by one, let me bring them up on stage so we can have a panel and a panel conversation. So first, let me bring up Amanda. Amanda, hi, you need to unmute yourself. Can everyone hear me now? Beautifully, welcome. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Uh, do you want me to give a brief intro? Um, actually, tell you what, while I bring up the other two uh, folks, why don't you tell us what you're gonna be working on for the next year? Sure, no problem. Uh, so I think as many of us in higher education uh, do, I wear many hats. Uh, my primary research is actually in empathy and virtual reality. So I'm having uh, students in a wide array of classes create virtual reality applications here on campus. Uh, I will also be leading workshops on using um, social annotation uh, platforms, and I'm part of the large Mellon grant that Book Traces has looking at the history of annotations. Mm. So, a lot of um, related digital writing and rhetoric things. Wow, very nice. Very nice. And are you going to be teaching over the next the fall and spring? Yes. So, I teach at Stevenson University, um, and this semester I am teaching a grant writing course and a course on Margaret Atwood, which is very exciting. Oh, that's fantastic timing. It's yes. kind of hard to go wrong with that. <laughs> yes. Well, great. Well, welcome. Welcome to the forum. We're glad to have you as a guest. Um, and uh, let's see, we like to also welcome uh, Nate, An Nate An Angel. Excuse me, I can't talk. Uh, Nate, why don't you unmute yourself and tell us what you're going to be working on for the next year. Oh, hi. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, beautifully. Uh, great. Um, I wasn't really expecting to talk, but um, I uh, work at the... Uh, nonprofit organization hypothesis that makes the web annotation technology and um, am on this next year I'm going to be partnering a lot with my colleague Jeremy Dean who will be up here in just a second to uh, really try to get web annotation into as many hands of educators and students as possible across the United States and around the world well um you do great work in that, and uh, I do want to thank you for kicking off a very, very long, involved, and very creative Twitter thread, which you then turned into a great blog post, which was then expanded by uh, Hypothesis. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I'll, come, I'll share a link to that in the chat. Please, and we'll come back to you and, uh, and bug you about this thing. So, Nate, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Remy, welcome. Unmute yourself and tell us what you're going to be working on for the next year. Hey, everybody. Uh, again, uh, my name is Rami Khalir. I'm an assistant professor of uh, learning design and technology at the University of Colorado in Denver. Uh, this coming academic year will be the fourth consecutive year of the marginal syllabus. It's a project that engages educators in interest in professional learning around educational equity topics through social and collaborative annotation. Um, and I'll also be revising um, a book about annotation that I think some folks in this forum are familiar with that concerns the history and the future of annotation, particularly as it concerns learning. So excited about those projects. Fantastic, as are we all. Thank you, Remy, and I'm glad you could make it. Uh, Jeremy, welcome. Uh, unmute yourself. And Hello, everybody. What are you going to be working on for the next year, Jeremy? 
Uh, well, I work at Hypothesis, and we launched an LMS app recently and have added some great functionality to that. So I think my primary job over the next year is going to be working with un universities and, and instructors to have success with the app and uh, work with our pilot program. So we've got a lot of part pa partners lined up for the fall and for the spring, and so I think I'm going to be pretty busy with that. Fantastic. Um, well, welcome. We're really, really glad Thank you're you. Thank you. Uh, friends, the way the forum works is typically I begin by asking one or two questions. Uh, and then what happens is the rest of you take over and all I do is relay questions to the guests um, because you are full of perspectives and ideas and uh, dreams for the future and we wanna share those. Um, so I'm just gonna start off really quickly, but as we start talking, um, please start coming up with the questions you'd like to ask and the comments you'd like to make. And again, to do that, just look at the white strip on the bottom of the screen, click that question mark button, and already two of you have done this. We'll get some great questions and conversation going. Um, I'd like to start, if I could, um, by asking uh, if each of you could take a whack at one of these questions, which is, what do you see now as, say, the top one or two best uses of hypothesis? I think there are probably a plethora of uses that you can see um, in something like the uh, conference agenda for the I Annotate conference that was held in May in Washington, D.C. Um, what I can speak directly to is uses in the humanities um, and good. in uh, the humanities higher education world specifically. So um, I think two of the things that I'm very interested in is using social annotation to um, engage students in what I call, what Kathy Davidson calls collaboration by difference. And that's learning from each mm. other. So mm. they, um, when a, a classroom or a cross curricular group is annotating a, the same text, they bring to the table their own expertise and knowledge that's beyond just that of the instructor. Um, and then you can have some bottom up learning, some really um, student driven, student led learning um, where they're providing resources for each other, multimodal resources, which is really um, one of my interests in the tool. And the second is for rhetorical analysis mm. in this age mm. of um, understanding web design and understanding web based content. Mm -hmm. um, I think using social annotation software, not only to content, not only to comment on text, but on the design elements of web-based text. So things like font choices, image, mm. um, video, um, you know, headers, hyperlinks. Page um, layout. Things like that. Page layout, exactly. So um, going using a web-based tool for web-based learning, right? To really explore the medium as well as the message. Brilliant. Those are two very, very powerful uses. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and how about the uh, Jeremy or Remy? What would one of you add to that as well? I can't tell if Remy's there, so I'll give him a chance to to prove Please. his existence and and go first. Um, I think I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about two really polar uh, opposites in, on the spectrum of an annotation use. Uh, the first is is within the LMS and the LMS integration that we have, and some affordances that come with tying into the uh, to the system, you know, systems of the university. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot more work around, and obviously we've always been sort of a close reading tool for the kind of projects that Amanda uh, talks about um, that allow for just, you know, collaboration on top of a document, but also sort of really deep, slow reading. Um, but tying into the LMS, tying into some uh, standards like Caliper for metrics, I'm really interested in the way that we can then step back from those uh, close encounters of, of collaboration and close readings of, of texts and look at the data of annotation, uh, both how that, that data can be surfaced to students and leveraged uh, and teachers in their, you know, understand of where students are um, and also uh, possibly beyond that. So that's that's one piece. Uh, the other piece is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. It's, you know, outside the LMS, um, somewhat riffing off of what Amanda was uh, alluding to in terms of the this moment that we're in. Hypothesis has always had a really great project associated with us called um, climate feedback, where climate Ooh. experts go and uh, basically fact check articles about climate change um, and intervene in the public journalism space and uh, and, and sometimes have, have gotten retractions from major journalistic organizations. I'm really interested in launching you know thousands of such projects, but really uh, grounded in student student uh, expertise. So uh. students are taking courses, uh, say on the history of the Middle East, 
and then they can go and like this is much like the the projects you've seen with Wikipedia where students are editing Wikipedia articles and sort mm -hmm. of bringing their knowledge to bear in a public space. Uh, I'd like to see a hypothesis used in the same way. So people would get to edit the not just the Wikipedia but the entire web conceivably. Yeah, go to whitehouse.gov and drop some nice. truth. <laughs> oh, nice. You hear you heard it here friends. This is the uh, the, the web-based annotation rebellion begins now. Uh, the um, so Remy, by the way, is having some bandwidth issues. Um, so um, we may have to just hear from him. Uh, Remy, uh, do you have enough audio that you can take a whack at the question? So the bandwidth may be a problem, um, but um, Remy will communicate with me via chat and I can relay text back to the rest of you. In the meantime, um, we have uh, Jeremy and Amanda. Um, so let me just go back to, um, if I can combine the two of you, uh, Jeremy, I, I wasn't really being sarcastic with my, with my last comment. I'm, 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 I'm quite serious about this. And I, I'm, I'm inspired in part by what Amanda said via uh, Kathy Davidson. Um, there seems to be, a, there's, a, there's a politics to any technology, um, a wide range of politics. And it, it seems to me that, uh, that there are all kinds of potentials for that to unfold in that web annotation. So one could use a tool like Hypothesis to, and uh, a politician can annotate uh, an opposition politician's website. Uh, a student could either uh, share their, uh, resist, their resentment or their approbation of another political figure. Um, and this is, I mentioned politics with, you know, with a capital P, but this can happen in other ways as well. Uh, with um, If we go to a publisher's website or to a company's website, um, how, do you, how do you see that politics unfolding right now? Want to go first? <laughs> No, okay. No, you uh, go. No, you go. No, I'll, I'll pick uh, on you. Go ahead, Jeremy. A very Start complicated off. question is something that I've been wrestling with uh, since my days at, at Rap Genius when uh, that platform was getting in various kinds of trouble for yeah. sort of inappropriate uses of uh, annotation, uh, more abusive use of annotation, um, less liberatory. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a very complicated question. I don't think annotation is uh, immune to the same troubles that Twitter or any other social media platform uh, has. And uh, so I think, you know, we need to be responsible about addressing that stuff. And, and the good thing is that Hypothesis and the folks there for a long time have been really serious about these issues, having internal conversations, having external conversations about what moderation looks like, uh, what rights do the owners of websites have to um, disallow annotation if they so choose. Um, so we're very open and, and thinking through it, but I think it's still a very, very complicated question, right? I mean, uh, I, I don't know that I know the right answer to whether, um, you know, for example, uh, basically writing on top of whitehouse.gov today, I would find, not to betray, my, um, to be completely obvious about my own politics, a sort of liberatory experience, right? right. Um, but I could, you know, eight years ago, see it being one that was abusive and, and inappropriate, and I don't know that I'm the one to, to make that choice. But um, so that's in terms of the public. I mean, fortunately for the education application of hypothesis, I think it's really about uh, local communities and how yeah. they monitor themselves. Uh, most annotation education is taking place in private groups in which teachers are the moderators of the content. Um, and so they have some control and of course it's a classroom so they can set up some expectations and some rules of engagement ahead of time. But uh, also following Kathy Davidson, uh, I don't know where I get this from her, but I've, I've been thinking lately about the idea of um, before a community, in this, in this case, a classroom begins annotation as a project, um, brainstorming together and maybe ratifying some documentation around yes. um, how are we gonna behave here? Uh, how are we gonna treat each other? And thinking through that kind of thing deliberately ahead of time, co uh, with, with students involved. Um, is a powerful way to kind of set expectations. Really hard to do that on the web at large, <laughs> um, but at least hypothesis, I think, in terms of public annotation is really thinking about that with our community guidelines and the way we set up moderation to try to be, um, you know, cultivating a culture of yeah. uh, annotation. I love the way you bring this right back to the classroom, uh, both uh, theoretically and, the, and also so practically. Um, thank you. I want to build on that, but but Amanda, what's what's your take? And, and uh, I think Jeremy set me up perfectly for what <laughs> I, I was thinking in response to that. And that's as an educator, I always um, think of part of my role, especially in classes like digital publishing, when we're really thinking about these questions essential to the course, as creating digital citizens. So I have several assignments that are in the public. I have students live tweet their readings of novels. 
I have students right. use Hypothesis on the public stage. I have students use a public course blog that is Creative Commons licensed. Mm -hmm. um, and in all of these instances, I talk about the appropriate language used in these spaces, both the language they're using to communicate to the general public, but also to each other. So anyone who's read YouTube comments or comments on the Chronicle of Higher Education knows that we have a problem with the way that we interact in online spaces and what a better way to discuss those problems, discuss the kind of bullying and rhetoric and trolling that happens in those spaces than in the classroom. So I like to tell this one uh, kind of humorous anecdote, but I had a student once um, on it, in a public chat space um, ask another student, yo, add me on Snap, right? Mm. And the, the, it was a male student and the female student responded, nah, <laughs> right? And this was in a classroom space. So it gave me the opportunity to talk about like, is this the appropriate place for this conversation? Is this sure. the appropriate language to be using on our course site? Um, what, what kind of language should we be using in this space? And there, you mm. can talk about community, discourse communities, and you can talk right. about kind of um, code switching and all of these great concepts through those more casual conversations that you then hope that they will transfer and apply to the general public, right? To their Twitter accounts, to their YouTube accounts, to Reddit, God forbid, whatever, right? <laughs> well, th that's, a, that's a really good response. And it, it seems that in part, both of you are, are talking about ways of using hypothesis in the classroom that are not unique to hypothesis. Uh, you're describing how students should treat each other, I mean, offline, face to face, uh, as well as online using whatever other technology, email or, or, or the LMS. Um, that's really, really powerful. Um, I wanted to follow up, but already we have questions piling in and I wanna bring up Peter Wallace, who has a really, really good question. Um, let's have, let's add him to the stage, please. All right, can you hear me now? There you are, welcome. Great, hi, thanks. And thank you both for all of your work. This is really interesting and engaging and is connecting with questions that I've been thinking about for a long while. So my background is kind of in adult education um, and participatory communities of education. And I'm really curious to follow up on this question of like, how do we get more people engaged in a more meaningful way of, of say, you know, writing on whitehouse.gov. Uh, um, have any of you worked with or seen good examples of structured annotations because the problem is often that uh, when there's annotation on a document the and everyone's writing on whitehouse.gov, the text becomes indeterminate in length, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas we did an experiment here at University of Washington in a storytelling class with kind of a hybrid where students were commenting what they saw, but also commenting with particular tags that allowed them to say, okay, I'm seeing, you know, a, a particular use of color here. And we were then able to map to a document, okay, here's a, here's a kind of in a, in a snapshot visible map of this document. In a similar way, I've been thinking about, um, uh, you know, here's a map of the, let's say, uh, the falsehoods in this speech, or here's a map of um, the, the perhaps proper or improper uses of metaphor. Um, and engaging people in that dialogue in a way where it can become immediately visible through annotation as opposed to people writing text. Thanks, that was a long question. That's a great question. Stick around, don't go down yet. Well, who wants to try that? Amanda? I can't say that I've necessarily done this in a space like whitehouse.gov or in a, in a space where you're annotating those kinds of very volatile, um, uh, controversial spaces, but, um, in a course that I think every university um, in America has in the freshman composition course, right? right. Um, students often desire that kind of structure guided um, exercise. They don't, you know, just saying annotate this text may not be enough for them to engage. So there's a very popular, um, frankly, not new, um, uh, kind of concept of annotation called the PI model. So it's point, um, illustrate, explain. Right. So the point would be your idea or your perspective, illustrate that. So the evidence, right, the, the they say to your I say and the explain uh, explaining that evidence in connection with your idea. Right. So I have actually done some work with um, lower level students in having them annotate using the pie model. 
So highlight the author's point, highlight the evidence, highlight their explanation of that, how the evidence connects to their point. And then, you know, in the comment section, provide your explanation, your links, your tags, right? You can tag them, those three, those things as well. Um, so it essentially allows students to reverse outline, if that's a familiar term to folks, uh, to reverse outline um, scholarly articles or web-based um, publications in a way that then allows them to create their own outlines and their own arguments based on those examples or models. Starting with the point. Very nice. That was a really interesting way of doing it. Um, Jeremy, do you want to add to this? Uh, sure. I mean, I think Peter, you answered your own question to a little bit in terms of thinking about the way that tags can work and other, and you know, Amanda adds to that with other sort of forms of sort of deliberate annotation activity. I mean, one of the cool things about hypothesis, I think, is that uh, as I think you said, you no, know, all platforms are political and all, all platforms by design, you know, have some bias in their design. But one of the cool things I like about hypothesis is that the annotation window is really uh, it is an, another sort of blank page. It is a blank margin in the sense that a teacher can guide students in that space. A teacher can make that unguided, um, but a teacher can also guide that in all kinds of deliberate ways. And using tags certainly can help filter uh, noise um, on a particular text. Using tags can also help um, investigations cohere around a topic. So say you are researching gun control and there's a particular fallacy in gun control arguments, and just thinking back to the freshman comp here, um, you could identify that in various uh, you know, resources and then have a, gather, a collection of resources that were all sort of using the same uh, fallacy. I think the other way to do, to do it is to uh, let students do the in, uh, inquiry independently, right? So then rather than gather on the, um, I guess it wouldn't be a climate change document at whitehouse.org or uh, gov anymore, but um, whatever. Uh, it, rather than gathering on a particular document, um, you send students off to do independent inquiry, and there they sort of have their own space to, um, to, to, to do the kind of activity Amanda did, and it can be brought together uh, through you know, more distant reading as a group. Can you just really quickly, uh, sorry for a follow-up question, oh, but what's your best platform for uh, for the tagging that you're talking about? Because um, I'd love to get more of our instructors thinking about this. Um, and on the climate one, we actually had a really good instructor doing videos and having students um, respond on a Likert scale for every 30 mm -hmm. seconds of the video, whether it was an emotional or intellectual argument, kind of a similar mm -hmm. classroom use, mm -hmm. but for video in this case. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a shill for a hypothesis, and we have a tagging feature, so I'll just I'll just say that. But I mean, there are you know d dozens of plugins to sort of bookmark and and do different things to bring resources together. But you can annotate with a tag, and I have seen structured uh, annotations that uh, that really are only a tag. That is, there's no content to the annotation. Students are really mm -hmm. just they're not bookmarking anymore, right? They are because that's on the level of the document. Uh, they are. Uh, Doing a closer earmark, or, or you know, whatever you want to call that, dog dog ear earmark, dog yeah. ear. Um, Thank you. I'll have to look into that. I, I didn't. I'm excited that Hypothesis has that now. And just one thing I'll say about that that's really cool is that every annotation. Uh, this is one of the really sort of magical things about Hypothesis and the 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 uh, web standard that we've helped push through with the W3C. Every annotation is a URL. So every time you create an annotation, it's nice. a link that you can send somebody directly to. Um, which, as my colleague Johnny Dell, I'm going to butcher his the way he talks about, but he talks about if the web is a sort of information fabric, then these annotations are increasing the thread count, and that's an incredibly powerful thing. Um, um, perhaps Nate might even be able to jump back in here, but I remember there was a speaker at the I Annotate conference who was doing this for his dissertation work. So he was um, kind of annotating texts across the web in different spaces and tagging them based on his kind of research goals for his dissertation and then bringing all those annotations together as notes to, to write wow. the dissertation. Wow, uh, maybe Nate remembers the speaker's name, but it was a great um, great use of the platform. Nate, let me know if, uh, if, if you can come up with a citation for this. Um, uh, this is terrific. Uh, again, Peter, thank you very much for a really, really great question. Uh, again, if you're new to the forum, this is the kind of conversation that we can have, varying from the very practical to the very theoretical. Um, to the uh, uh, very scholastic. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And I love that annotation as well. It would, it would intersect with my dissertation work. Good luck. Good luck, sir. Um, 
we have uh, we have more questions that are just piling in. So again, if you'd like to ask one, uh, just head to the bottom of the screen and click the question mark button. Uh, and in the meantime, while you're thinking, and while you're doubtless off annotating pages right now as we speak, uh, I'd like to welcome the awesome Kate Borowski. Um, let's see if we can bring her up on stage. This is going to sound like a kindergarten question after the last discussion you had. Um, no. So I saw a hypothesis demonstrated 100 years ago at a new media consortium <laughs> thing. And I'm, I loved it from the minute I saw it. But I'm a librarian, so I don't have my own students to do this. But I'm working with faculty now who are really interested in doing this. And one of them's here with me. But um, my question is, um, I've always been sort of curious, when you use it with undergrads, have you had any problems with students just sort of jumping in and using it? Um, let's see, I wrote my questions down. How, how readily do they participate? Um, do they bounce off each other's comments as well as off the text? And then do you think their comments are more or less thoughtful in the social environment? And you can answer any of those or none of those. Those were just sort of things to, that I had thought of. If Jeremy yeah. doesn't mind, I'm totally going to jump in. <laughs> I, do this, I do this in every single one of my classes from the remedial writing course all the way up through my 400 level mm -hmm. courses. Um, so I think I have kind of a, a lot of examples to share here. I can tell you that as far as jumping in and using it, um, the you know, web-based platform is the one I've primarily been using, but um, Jeremy and I actually have just worked with uh, our instructional technologist to add it to our LMS. We now have the Blackboard uh, version of Hypothesis as well. But the as long as they can, you know, easily put in their email address and confirm um, using the link, that's that's it. And they're used to doing that from signing up for social media sites, shopping lists, whatever, right? Um, so that the actually getting started is very, very simple. Um, I do always recommend giving at least some structure and Gardner Campbell disagrees <laughs> with me on this, but um, I, I, for the very first time we do it, I always say like 10 annotations and five replies, right? Just so they can hmm. kind of get used to the possibilities of the platform. And I um, give a list of five kind of um, potential annotation types. I say, um, you know, definitions, right? Defining words or terms you don't know. Um, multimodal references. So links to videos, links to other websites like Wikipedia, mm. uh, links to images or images themselves. Um, uh, for example, I teach an article that has a reference to 2001 Space Odyssey, which right. my students don't know. <laughs> oh no, no, oh no. Um, I actually explain it to them that it's like Wally. No. Wally, the oh. Pixar movie. Oh my God. Right. Um, yeah. So I, every time I teach that article, someone links to like the trailer for 2001 right. and the, the Wikipedia page for 2001 or, you know, something like that. Um, and then I, I also um, ask for questions. So post questions that you have about the text like I don't understand what the author is talking about here or I you know I, I think they're getting at this but I'm not sure um, and what I call provocations so a provocation is a question that's meant to engage the other students in the class in discussions so like I disagree with this point for x y and z what do you think right um, and last but not least is um, um, I encourage let uh, kind of just like blanket, like, I like this, or I think this is cool, or like, right, this is right. neat kind of responses to the text, that, or this is funny, right, or this is sad um, kind of question or kind of comments. Um, and again, that's for the lower level students. Mm -hmm. For the upper level students, I um, encourage and have seen really strong cross references to other texts we're reading in the class. So Ooh. I want them to connect across our class and to their other classes. So one of the ma amazing moments in teaching that I had was in one of my 300 level book history classes, a student linked the content to our previous digital publishing course. Nice. So they, it was actually a Joanna Drucker text that they were linking to an article that was in, um, um, uh, I think JITP or a hybrid pedagogy, one of those two online pedagogy journals. So they were connecting, you know, a piece of scholarship to a full length text that we had read in a different class. So. Oh, that's terrific. Amanda, wow. that, thank you. That was really helpful. 
Um, and uh, Kate, is that a student behind you right now? She's <laughs> she's a professor. Hello. <laughs> I know they all look so young. <laughs> this is Amanda Sealing. She um, is a what recovering attorney yes. um, and teaching in our criminal justice program, and is really good about using technology and going getting into teaching and trying new things. So I brought her with me today. <laughs> Hello, Thank Professor Sealing. Hi. Welcome to the forum. We're glad to see you. Thank you. Amanda, thank you. That was really helpful. Well, that was a fantastic question, Kate. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, Jeremy, did you want to add to that? Um, uh, I don't have a lot to add. That was a brilliant response from Amanda. I think I'm going to, you know, get that clip for and put it just that response on our somewhere in our education resources because it was it was so good. Uh, I only had a couple other things. I mean, I do think it's important to be deliberate and there's a lot of different ways to be deliberate in how you introduce sanitation. And I think it matters on the context. You know, Gardner students may be more prepared to just go say something interesting and have great conversations. Other students may need more uh, scaffolding. It really depends on the context. Um, but I do think another thing, the only other thing I'll add to Amanda is that being present, you know, being there, engaging with them, modeling, mm -hmm. Uh, what what it's supposed to look like or what you're expecting, you know the one claim I can never make about hypothesis, uh, which is you know obviously death in that tech industry is it's not going to make your life easier, right? It could create more work for you because you're going to be engaged with your students and engaging with your students, and that it's going to you know require some level of uh, attention. In, in that case, if if we're going to talk about the cutthroat nature of uh, of business, is there can hypothesis or other annotation tools soak up some of our practices and other technologies? I mean, that is, can can we use web annotation to do some form of uh, discussion software or, you know, uh, instead of a discussion board, that kind of thing? Oh yeah, hypothesis is your answer for everything. You won't need Twitter anymore. You won't need Facebook. You won't need the discussion Email. forum. <laughs> um, yeah, because we want all these conversations to be grounded in text. You won't need Reddit. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, once we have video, you won't need Flipgrid, no offense to Flipgrid or whatever, or, you know, voice thread, you know, you'll be able to add voice and video in the margins of text, which is where at least, especially us in the humanities want to anchor our, um, our conversations. Um, but I do think it is a, I do think it is a replacement for the discussion forum. I find the discussion forum to, to not be very conducive to conversation, authentic conversation and uh, engagement between, you know, teachers and, and students and students and each other. And I think, uh, uh, annotation is, is more conducive to having something more like an authentic conversation one can have in a face-to-face in -face classroom where folks have the book open and you're talking about text and you're meeting right. each other through the text and, and having uh, you know actual conversation. So at the very least, I'll replace that. I don't know about Twitter yet. Um, so I'm going to push back a tiny bit. Um, <laughs> I don't think that it replaces face-to-face -face conversation. In fact, I use a hypothesis specifically to to better structure my face-to-face -face time with students. So I will assign mm. a collaborative reading, you know, from let's say, you know, Wednesday to Monday, right? And then I review all the students' highlights and comments, as Jeremy said, engage um, with their highlights and comments. And then the area of the text where no one has highlighted, that's what I teach. Uh, because typically brilliant. that is the spot that they didn't understand. Brilliant. Just to right? be clear, I wasn't suggesting that uh, this was going to replace face to face. I was suggesting I, that. I, I was just. I'm just. I'm just going to reiterate it. Um, in terms of platforms, I think in terms of extending the kind of interaction one can have face to face. Yes. I think in terms of authentic, you know, type of interaction online, right. that this is closer than Twitter or discussion forums gets. So, so my best example of this is E.M. Forrester's "The Machine Stops." It's yeah. a uh, short story written in 1919, I think. Incredible. Um, it, this, it has a section where one of the characters is talking about all of the like kind of great periods in history that she's going to talk about in her online lecture. Um, very prescient uh, mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. And um, no one ever highlights this because all the references she's making are fake, right? They're, they're fictional time periods that the author has created, but the students don't get that, right? They don't under, they think that they, they uh, look them up uh, and they can't find them. So they think that they just are wrong or they don't know or, you know, they don't share in that no. academic discourse of these mm. terms. Yeah. So no one ever highlights that paragraph. And I didn't realize that they didn't get the joke until I saw that no one highlighted that paragraph. Oh, wow. wow. So I, that's what I spent time on in class is talking about what E.M. Forster was doing 
in that I paragraph. See. So on the one hand, you it's kind of like a pedagogy of lacunae, right? Right. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, uh, we have more questions that are just piling up. Um, I wanted to thank you uh, for those. We have a quick co uh, com comments on Twitter. Um, Taylor Kendall wanted us to pay attention to two websites, uh, marginalsyllab.us, uh, which is a discussion about uh, pedagogy that uses hypothesis very heavily, and also crowd layers. Layers spelled L-A-A-E-R-S, which is Remy's awesome project that he uh, co-created um, that gives you more tools for annotation. And then uh, Nate uh, and Angel asked us to uh, look at climatefeedback.org. This is what uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier, and that's the URL to, to examine. Uh, and while you're thinking of more comments and while you have more uh, intense ideas, uh, let me bring up another person who has a video question. And this is our splendid fan, splendid friend of the program, uh, Roxanne Riskin. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, hi, Jeremy. Hi, Amanda. My question relates to the video question. Now, for example, when you're embedding a YouTube into the hypothesis for people to look at and review, now um, consider a YouTube that has a, a text document to that. How can you bring this hypothetical? How can you bring that text document into the hypothesis so that can be annotated? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood it though. Uh, you can embed YouTube videos in the margins of uh, uh, within annotations, but if there's a text associated with the YouTube video, like what, like uh, the comment section or some other? Right, if there's a transcript that follows the YouTube, for example, if it's um, including like closed captioning, there usually is a transcript and the courses that are fully accessible? Sure, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's an HTML version of the transcript, so if there's an HTML version of the transcript, you can annotate that. Um, you, know, you said, I think you may have said, bring something into Hypothesis. I mean, Hypothesis is brought to bear on other, pla on other platforms and other sources. So it could be taken, you can annotate YouTube comments at a YouTube, uh, at a YouTube site, you can't annotate within the video yet. You know, grab a, a piece of text or grab a timestamp. Although there are other tools that do that, and and we aspire to do image and video annotation. But anytime there's an HTML transcript of or PDF transcript of something like a, a video, you can go and annotate at the source of wherever that is. Very good. Very okay, good. thank you. Really good practical question. Um, we have a we have a giant question coming up right now uh, from a longtime friend and a deep thinker, um, uh, Tom Hames from Texas. We'll bring him up right now. But let me just say, we uh, please feel free to bring up these uh, giant questions or very, very detailed questions. Um, we're glad to hear all of your thoughts and uh, all of your feedback. So um, my question has to do with how we uh, see the information that is in uh, hypothesis and elsewhere. I mean, I tend to think of information as sets of connected ideas. And one of the things that I've been working on a lot lately is um, how text formats our ideas in certain linear fashions. And I think that some of the stuff that Vannevar Bush and Engelbart and others were really alluding to, and Ted Nelson, really alluding to was this idea that um, that is um, no longer sufficient in terms of mastering the complexity of the uh, of the ideas and issues that we have to deal with today. Um, annotation is a good step in that direction uh, and I think it's probably absolutely necessary to do that um, but I'm wondering where the next step is. I'm wondering if there's a way of looking at the information because right now when you're looking at a hypothesis screen, you're seeing two linear streams that are interconnected, but they're still linear streams. Um, whereas, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in my classes around with uh, concept mapping and as a way of connecting things on, on more than one dimension. Uh, and uh, I found it to be a very effective way because the human mind tends to think in those terms too. I mean, text is an artificial uh, barrier to how we think. It do, we don't think textually. We have to translate into text, and then we have to translate back out of text in, to make to make it work within our minds. 
Uh, and uh, which, by the way, according to Leonard Schlein, is actually sexist because apparently men do this better than women. Uh, but uh, from a neurological perspective, women are more visual, two-dimensional thinkers in terms of how they perceive the world. Uh, and uh, he connected that actually to the rise of uh, literacy uh, to the uh, decline of matriarchal societies in, in, in thousands of years ago. It's an interesting argument. Interesting. But, um, you know, I'm very much interested in trying to figure out ways to look at complex problems, both as a teacher, but also just sort of as general, how do we deal with problems like climate change? I mean, a climate change discussion is not Donald Trump is right, Donald Trump is wrong, here's my response to Donald Trump. You know, as much as we may want to annotate whitehouse.gov, you know how that ping pong is going to end up going. <laughs> you can see it on Twitter, right? So I'm asked the, the question, getting to the question along about um, the uh, um, question I have is: Are there plans within the platform to think about different ways of displaying the information that are less linear, that are more two dimensional? I mean, tagging does this a certain level, but how we look at these things, uh, I think, is going to be interesting going forward. That's a huge, huge stack of ideas, Tom. Let me uh, let me rephrase it just to suggest that maybe we can tackle it more theoretically than practically. I mean, there's sure. you know, I, I, we're not we haven't yet designed the thing you're looking for, but I don't know if Amanda has anything to say just about the idea of trying to rethink our relationship to information and text and the pathways through them. And then I can say something too. But um, so I, I do a lot of work with data visualization with distant reading, right? So I'm always thinking about the ways that we can see a text. In a variety mm -hmm. of ways. Um, I have students do basic distant reading projects where we are looking at a variety of texts, extracting common terms, um, concordance work, and looking at how those terms are used across a variety of texts. And I think mm. that's basically what you're getting at here, right, is this mm -hmm. idea of distant reading. Um, and I think Hypothesis is definitely a good candidate for that kind of work. You can definitely extract metadata from Hypothesis and do data visualizations of that. Um, people have and um, have already been doing that work. Um, maybe it would help if I could, uh, again, go kind of to a very practical assignment that I do in my class. So I have students do what I call a gallery walk. Um, I teach a class about asylum seeking. We work with a nonprofit um, that helps facilitate resources for asylum seekers. So I have students bring in one article from the past six months uh, on, a, on just the general concept of asylum seekers in, a, in America, in the United States. Um, I then have a librarian come in and talk about left, center, and right publications. She shows kind of that map of where different publications fall. And then students have to find an article from the opposite point of view of the first article they brought in. Nice. We put those up uh, around the physical walls of the classroom. And the students go around and look for loaded rhetoric in the articles. And they write down what loaded rhetoric they found on the left, what ones they found in the center, and what ones they found on the right. And then they pull everywhere, um, send them into me, and we create word clouds of what words they found in the left wow. publications, the center publications, and the right publications. And we look for shared language, and we look for different language. Right? This is a very basic way of getting at what you're talking yeah. about. Right? It's just like looking yeah. at language in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I guess what I'm saying is like maybe one tool doesn't have to do it all. <laughs> maybe we can Absolutely. do these things in kind of like more basic ways that students are more familiar with, with like highlighting and going around the classroom, but then taking it to a level of um, uh, of that kind of like group crowdsourced information. Mm -hmm. well, that's an amazing thing. Uh, Amanda, have you... Uh... Do you have photos of this process or any video? I'd love to I, like to, I mean, I, I do on my cell phone. <laughs> hey, sure, I'd, I'd love to share them with it. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's literally like articles taped on my classroom wall. Yeah. Um, but you could do it in a more digital way than that, although the poll everywhere piece is certainly using right. a, a digital tool. Um, do you find, um, you know, when you're when you're thinking about this uh, this method of visualization, I mean, hypothesis is a is a text centric uh, tool in many ways, and and you can see that from people in the humanities like myself who who embrace it. Do do we see web annotation evolving into a more transmedia format in say the next three years? Now we've got Jeremy here, so I should put him on the spot. Um, 
but yeah, what do you what do you think? How is this going to, or is it going to be a text uh, a text um, apparatus like say texting? Um, I mean, I think uh, you know, Hypothesis has always had aspirations for uh, to to work with image annotation and video annotation. Um, we've done early work there at our annual conference. I annotate. There's always folks at, at, working with the standard and other you know projects that are working more directly on image and video annotation. You know, maybe it's the English professor and me, but I think there's a lot of work to be done around, um, you know, building the kind of pathway, you know, Im imagining Vannevar Bush's, you know, trail pathways through knowledge yeah. just on the text, just on the hook of text um, and getting that right. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, even though I know image and video annotation are, are really cool and, and we may go there sooner rather than later, I think there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done in getting, you um, text annotation correct. Uh, of course, video and images and multimedia can go into the annotations, but just really working with HTML and digitized text and how, uh, you know, working across platforms, working across formats, um, there's a, there's still a tremendous amount of work uh, to be done there, not just on the actual mechanics of doing that, but also what uh, Tom was saying, which is the visualization of that. Um, I think that is still an area of work to do, right? Like I can go to Amanda's public, uh, profile of an hypothesis and start following what she's been annotating lately, maybe dive into some documents and, and jump around. Um, and that works, but I'm not sure it works as well as as Bush imagined it uh, and really being able to see her pathway or follow her pathway. Um, and so that there's work to be done in that sort of secondary sort of visualization space around how we see and moving in and out of texts that have annotations on them. Okay, well said. Um, Tom, thank you for that great question. Uh, we have time for uh, one last question, uh, and thank you, uh, both of you, for uh, such really, really great responses to this. We also have a question from uh, Jacob um, Gawal. Um, and Jacob, I keep massacring your name. Um, my apologies um, if it's Gawal or Gawal. Um, but uh, tell us about uh, tell us about your piece. You just had a, an article about web annotation you wanted to share. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so it's not really about web annotation specifically. It does touch on web annotation, but it, it's about syllabi and the implicit metaphors that, um, that are sort of built into syllabi, especially the, the dominant metaphor is a syllabi being a contract. But there is there's a moment uh, marginal syllabus project and the way in which the marginal syllabus project um, frames syllabi metaphorically as a conversation space um, to, to have about course procedures and so on, which is very different from, from a contract. Um, so that, that article is out, out this morning at Hybrid Pedagogy. Um, Great. And and also just to, to respond very briefly to the last topic of conversation around a hypothesis, I think there's there's room for adapting Engelbart's idea of view control. I think that that's a way that hypothesis could grow in terms of having different ways of visualizing. I was I was just listening to that, imagining like a a user like a like a timeline of a, and this already kind of exists, um, but um, something something to do with I read this at this point and then this at this point and then this at this point and here's Ooh. sort of the, the the view of the annotations in a sort of more zoomed out um, way. Um, I'm I, just, yeah, I was just uh, you cut out a little bit uh, in in describing what yeah. your article was about. It's about mm -hmm. annotating syllabi themselves, correct? Uh, it includes a conversation about annotating syllabi, but largely it's about um, this metaphors that are implicit in syllabi um, and expanding our meta view of what those metaphors could be beyond the, the sort of contract metaphor that, that gets brought up repeatedly. I'm really looking forward to reading that because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we just integrated Hypothesis into our LMS, which is Blackboard. And my first assignment for all of my classes this term is to annotate my syllabus using Hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, yeah. I'm yeah. also nice. hanging out in the Hypothesis oh. annotations of the article itself. Cool. 
Awesome. Uh, and this is, of course, something that, that Ramey has, you know, I think every semester sort of tweets out, people should annotate their syllabus. I think he's written about this. And it's really unfortunate that we didn't get to have Remy here, but I'm glad that marginal syllabus got mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to add something else that kind of connects to both these questions, uh, which is for people to Great. check out crowdlayers.org. Um, because crowd layers is along the lines of what Jacob was just saying, a way, and, and ties into what Amanda said earlier, a way to step back from the conversation and look at the sort of pathways and conversations that are happening in annotation um, and comments that are happening in annotation from, from a different perspective through different you know, uh, lenses of, of time and space and networked relationships. Jeremy, are you familiar with Tags Explorer for Twitter? I uh, think I've checked so, it out before, yeah. but yeah. That's yeah. What, so when I have my students live tweet the reading of the novel, uh, of a novel, I use Tags Explorer to do exactly that, right? You can kind of trace their conversations. You can visualize them around clusters of, of tweets and topics. Um, and it is a free to use um, open source tool. Um, you just have to scrape the Twitter API, put it in, you're good. Well, that's a great suggestion, uh, visualization. Um, Listen, Jacob, thank you very much for um, a, a really good article, which we should all be reading soon. And then I hate to say this, but we have to wrap up our session. Uh, we are at the end of the hour. Um, and after all kinds of great discussion, uh, we are out of time. Uh, listen, Amanda um, and, uh, and Jeremy and Remy, if you can hear this, if your bandwidth is, is back, how can we follow your work? What are the best ways to keep up with you? Um, if you have follow-up questions for me, Twitter is always a good idea. I'm just at Amanda LaCastro on Twitter. Um, uh, my website, which is digitocentrism.com, um, has all of my other relevant contact information as well. Um, and um, I will be giving a keynote at this year's NCTE, the National uh, Council for Teachers of English, wow. in November here in Baltimore. Um, so, Woo! Excellent. And Jeremy? Uh, that's awesome. I didn't know that, Amanda. Um, that's uh, all the more reason to go. Um, uh, yeah, d a doctor. What am I at Twitter? Doctor underscore J Dean uh, at Twitter for follow up questions. Um, hypothesis uh, slash education. Um, also, education at hypothesis. So, um, yeah, reach out. Happy to keep, keep the conversation going. And Ramey has a book at MIT Press Pub. I don't know if somebody can tweet it or share it in the chat here, but he has a book with an. Uh, and Taro, um, and uh, you can, I think it's open for annotation on the PubPub Pub platform. And so if you are haven't had your fill about annotation right now, uh, you can go read the seven chapters there and you can annotate. And uh, he just shared this on Twitter, um, so you can all find that there. Um, Jeremy, Remy, and uh, Amanda, thank you so much for really, really a deep dive into this great technology. Thank you for your work too. You both are just creative geniuses. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, don't go yet, because we have to tell you what's happening next and what's on next. But again, let me thank everybody for terrific questions, um, because that was really, really rich. You came with us from a wide range of topics. Um, thank you. Now, next week, uh, we're going to uh, zoom into the LMS. We're very privileged to have the CEO of Instructure, the company that makes Canvas. So Dan Goldsmith is going to be talking with us about where the LMS can be going, so please join us with your thoughts and questions. We'd also like to make sure that you get a whack at the survey, so make sure you get to look at the tinyurl.com slash forum survey 2019. If you're on our email list, you've already gotten that in your email. And if you haven't, or if you have any issues with it, just quickly shoot me a note. Now, if you'd like to keep talking about annotation or the LMS or anything about the future of education and technology, we have all these places on social media for you to explore. So please head to Twitter, Slack, uh, LinkedIn or Facebook, we'd be glad to talk with you. In the meantime, thank you all for a really great conversation. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try something now, uh, starting a new tradition here. I'll stick around here for about five minutes if you guys would like to talk, but more importantly, if you'd like to talk with each other. So please um, take some time and chat, and I'll be here. And otherwise, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>